Welcome to The Spotlight, the podcast where veterans and military spouses connect and share how their military experience has transformed their lives and their businesses. Here's your host, Bob Lalvin. Hey, this is your host, Bob Lalvin, founder of the Veteran Crowd Network, the network that brings veterans and veteran-led businesses together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. And you are tuning into the spotlight. Welcome, everybody. This is Bob Lalvin, the host of the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. I am honored today to have Melissa Stockwell as our guest on the Spotlight. She is a U.S. Army veteran, a Paralympian. Melissa, thank you for stepping into the Spotlight. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Happy to be here. I, I got to tell you, I am so impressed by what you've done Uh I, I just consider this a great honor to have you on the program. Thank you so much for doing it. Could you take me back though? Let's, let's start uh, on April the 13th, 2004. Can you take us back to that fateful day? I can. I know it's almost been 17 years. April 13th is coming up. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I was over in Iraq. Uh, sir, I was a part of the first cavalry division. So part of the U S army and, and the transportation corps. So we had been deployed to Iraq in um, late March of 2004, and we're supposed to be over there for a year. My main role was as a convoy commander, so basically on the road a lot, leading convoys, um, you know, delivering supplies and, and, and whatnot. And April 13th, 2004 kind of started out just like any other day. Um, you know, we woke up early, got into our vehicles, but about 10 minutes into the convoy that day, about 10 minutes into the ride, we went under this bridge and there was this you know deafening boom um and turns out our vehicle had been struck by a roadside bomb and a vehicle swerved we hit a guardrail we kind of ended up crashing into this lady's house but what could make um a pretty long story pretty short it did result in the loss of my left leg above the knee so i am now an above the knee amputee on my left side mm. That was a that was a real life changing day. Take us back. You went to the University of Colorado, and uh, how did how did you wind up joining the Army in the first place? And then I live in Richmond, Virginia. I'm curious if you came through Fort Lee at some point uh, outside of Richmond. You know, never or, or Fort Eustis, maybe. Oh, maybe yeah. it's. Says, yep. I, I got my, I got my forts mixed up. That's <laughs> my bad. So um, so I joined the Army. It, it, pretty short and sweet. I. I I think I was born a patriot, loved our country from a very young age, kind of wanted to give back and wear the uniform, have that flag patch on my shoulder. So I did join the ROTC program in college in Boulder and was commissioned as a lieutenant um, when I graduated in May of 2002. Um, as part of the Transportation Corps, I did do my officer basic course at Fort Eustis, Virginia. So I got to spend about six months there before being sent on to my very first duty assignment in Texas, Fort Hood, Texas, part of the 1st Cavalry Division. But I loved my time there. It was great. And, um, you know, is Richmond, the, I now I can't even remember. There's, You're close to Newport News, actually, Newport where Fort, Newport, 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 Newport Eustis is, yeah. Yeah, so a big night for all of us, you know, new officers was going into Newport News and spending the night there. <laughs> <laughs> Go down to the beach, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you go into the army and, and, uh, go over to Iraq. Uh, you, you tell a story on one of your videos. You're actually a senior at the university of Colorado, I think when nine 11 happened. Mm -hmm. I was, yep. It was, yep. I was a senior, um, September 11th. I'm sure many can recall it was a Tuesday and like every other Tuesday, it was ROTC day at college. So I was wearing my uniform. We had classes that day and obviously you know, woke up to, you know, what turning on the news and seeing the news unfold or the start of it and to riding my bike with my still not sure what to do, putting on my uniform, riding my bike down to class, ROTC was my first class of the day and going into the classroom and sitting with kind of all my fellow cadets as we watched the news unfold on TV. And it was that day that the instructor paused the TV and said, today your lives are going to change. Not a matter of if you'll deploy to a foreign country, it's more a matter of when. So we all pretty much knew that our the, traje the trajectories of our lives were going to change from, from that moment. You were an athlete in college. You were a gymnast. So I was a gymnast growing up. That's what I did. It's what I loved. It was my passion. And 
I went to college though and actually stopped doing gymnastics, but I did, um, I was a diver and a rower in, in, in college. I mean, okay. So on the crew team, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, um, you know, you've described yourself as always being an athlete. Well, we'll, we'll come back to that, but tell us about, uh, you know, after the, after the accident, coming back to Walter Reed and, and you really kind of had some epiphanies, I think at that point in time. I got to Walter Reed and was able to kind of, you know, look around and take in everything. I saw soldiers that were missing two, three, four limbs. They had traumatic brain injuries. They had lost their eyesight. And so it really put things in perspective. So thinking, you know, how lucky I was to only have lost one leg. I still had three good limbs and to made, I made a promise to myself then to live my life for those who no longer could and really not to let stop not to let losing a leg stop me from doing anything that I wanted to do. So uh, let's, let's talk about that journey. So, so you get out of Walter Reed. When did you first decide to uh, tell the story about how you first decided to get back into athletics? Because you said once an athlete, always an athlete, right? Definitely. I, I, I fully agree. Yes. I think that's the case for most people. I wasn't sure. So Walter Reed, you know, I, the first order of business was to learn to walk again. So learn to walk with a prosthetic leg. And then I wanted to be independent again and just to like make sure that I could live my life on my own. Um, but not long after I was there, there was this presentation put on um, at the hospital called about the US Paralympics. And I, I knew nothing about it, but which is crazy now, but I went to this presentation and I learned about if I trained hard enough, if I dedicated myself to a sport that I could compete on the world's biggest athletic stage for somebody with a disability. So when I was a younger gymnast, I dreamt of going to the Olympic games. Obviously that didn't happen, but it was almost like I had a second chance. So I realized pretty early on that somehow, some way I wanted to be a, a Paralympian. And so you chose swimming to I begin did. with. Yeah, I started with swimming. Um, there happened to be a pool that Walter Reed at the hospital and I got in it and you know, the water just had this kind of immediate healing effect. It's almost like I forgot, like I was missing my leg. I was able to get in, you know, I was just like everybody else in the pool. And I just, I love the feel of the water. I randomly love the smell of chlorine everything just kind of made sense. So yes, I decided to give it a shot in the sport of swimming. And uh, you, so when did you go to Colorado Springs and begin training as a, as a Paralympian though? Tell me about that. I'm, I'm a little, I want to follow that track. Yep. Yep. So I was, so I was medically, so I got hurt in 04. I was medically retired in 2005. And after I was medically retired, I moved um, to Minnesota where I went back to school for prosthetics. So learning how to fit other amputees with artificial limbs. Hmm. And once I graduated from there in 2007 is kind of when I put everything on hold moved out to Colorado Springs and really act, late 2007, early 2008 to try to make the Beijing Paralympic swim team. And you made it. I did. I was a total long shot to make the team, but I, I did. Yes. I think the adrenaline kicked in during the qualifying. What do you think happened there? Uh, you know, I think I, I, you know, I moved out to Colorado in early 2008, put everything on hold and I swam, you know, for six months leading into it. And I think, you know, you, it sounds so cheesy, but like hard work pays off and, but it, like it does, I mean, dreams do come true when you put in the work. I think, I think I just put the work in and it was just my time to shine. Then. So, you, so you go to Beijing and, and uh, uh, tell us about that because there's a very interesting conclusion to your trip to Beijing in 2008. So I went to Beijing, you know, I got to wear the USA uniform. I had family and friends who made the trip and, you know, time and money to make the trip. And I had about 20 family and friends over there. So I swam in, in, in three events in Beijing and I had, you know, the dream to be on the podium. I mean, who doesn't want to be on the podium when you go to the mm -hmm. Paralympic games and I didn't have best times. I didn't make finals. And I felt like I had let, you know, everybody down myself, my country, my teammates, but I learned a pretty cool lesson because at the end of the Paralympic games, there's a closing ceremonies and typically it's, and they, someone is nominated to carry the American flag in to closing ceremonies and kind of represent, you know, the entire U S delegation, all the athletes. And it's typically reserved for someone who's done way more than, you know, 
get a participation medal. <laughs> like that, mm -hmm. you know, that, typically it's reserved for someone who's been on the podium and it did well athletically. But when my team teammates nominated me for that honor, I realized that, you know, it's, we all want the medals. You want to be on top that a lot of times it's about the journey to get there with that's worth so much more than the medals. So getting to carry that flag in, you know, rep the entire U S delegation, I was representing them. It was, it was a moment that, um, just the magnitude of the moment was just so powerful. Help, help me understand how many athletes attend the Paralympic games in, in Beijing, in Beijing, as an example, how many were there for how many um, countries were represented? I, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I couldn't tell you, I know from the U S a couple hundred, maybe I, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. I wish I could tell you. I'm not sure though. How do help me understand now, how do they set up the games? You, you're a, you know, have a amputated leg, but how do they sort of make it fair? Do you compete against other people that have a similar disability? Yep. Is that the way it works? They do. Yep. So there's, it's called the classification system and each sport kind of has their own classification system, but each athlete goes through this classification process and there's doctors there, there's, um, you know, they test how long your limb is, range of motion. Do you have any other, um, you know, deficiencies on the other side? Are there any other, you know, can, does my arm have a full range of motion? So they test all this stuff and it come, they come up with like a point, a number of points that you have. And then those points kind of put you into a specific category. So I'm in what's called the severe leg impairment category. So the majority of people I compete against are missing their leg above the knee. There is, you know, occasionally you'll have someone who may be missing or have have an impairment on both sides. So they're not necessarily missing their leg, but they have enough of an impairment for it to be a severe leg impairment. So um, they do the best that they can. It's never going to be completely fair, but they do the best that they can. And what was your event? What style of uh, swimming did you compete in? So I did freestyle. I did the hundred freestyle, four hundred freestyle, and the hundred butterfly. Got it. The butterfly takes some coordination. Well, I don't know. I do it now. And I'm like, what, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, interesting. So uh, t tell us about the path to becoming a triathlete. Uh, how did that happen? I used to think triathletes were crazy. So it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't Whoever disagree with you. Who but wants to run a marathon and bike a hundred miles and good. Well, that's then, iron. Then you got the wrong body style for swimming, you know, cause yeah. bikers have no body fat. So, you know, how do you even uh, stay above the water? Well, so, Okay, so after Beijing in 2008, um, in 2009, I was invited to do a triathlon out in California with a group called the Challenge Athletes Foundation. And I thought, triathlon, that sounds crazy. And But it was this group of wounded veterans that was going to go out and do this triathlon. So I thought, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So I went out there, did my first race, crossed the finish line, and I, I mean, I was hooked. The challenge of all three sports, being on the same course as able-bodied athletes, I mean, I kind of fell in love with the sport um, from, from the start. Did you run a full marathon in these no, events? Okay. No, so, so triathlon has a, a lot of varying distances. Anything right. from a super sprint triathlon all the way up to an Ironman. Right. The Ironman is kind of the one that everyone always thinks about. It's uh, the big one, a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike and a marathon at the end. So I, I have done one of those, but that's not what I compete in. When you compete at the Paralympic level, it's a sprint distance triathlon. So that's comprised of a half a mile swim, a 13 mile bike and a 5k run. So significantly shorter, but it is all about speed. I mean, Ironman, you know, long and steady, you know, sprint triathlon, short and fast. So they each have their own, you know, difficulties behind them. Okay. So, so you began training and, and all of a sudden now you're a world-class triathlete para athlete. I, I'm gonna get all my terminologies mixed up. But you know, when did you discover that? And, and then you went to you went to uh, the Olympics again in Rio? Did you go in 2012? Or did you go first time in 2016? 2015. Okay. All right. Well, take me to Rio. Yeah. So I started triathlon in 2009. I learned pretty quickly that I, I was I was pretty good at it. And was able to kind of become part of the paratriathlon national team. And we traveled around the nation, around the world, competing in various events. But it was not yet a Paralympic sport. So the Paralympic sports, that's like the highest level you can get to. But we had world championships. I would do those every year. And in 2012, it was announced that it was going to be a, a sport in the 2016 Paralympic Games. 
So I thought, all right, next goal, make it to the 2016 Paralympic Games in triathlon. So a lot of training. Um, I did, my husband and I got married. We had a, a kid um, for any you know, parent or mothers, um, mm -hmm. parenthood changes you as a mother, it changed my body. It changes your, I mean, it changes everything. So trying to have my son real quick in quotes, um, and then come back to elite level status was extremely difficult because I had a very short amount of time to do it. So again, kind of a long shot to make the team for, for Rio. And it's kind of this based on this point system where you do certain races, you get points, you get a world ranking. So Anyways, I ended up qualifying for Rio. And of all days that my race could have happened, it would happen to be on September 11th. So you can kind of imagine the meaning behind it. September 11th, 2016, I'm over in Rio, put on my USA uniform that morning and just know that my race is about, you know, so much more than, than me. Swim, bike and run up and down the streets of Copacabana Beach in Rio. I come across the finish line in third place. So getting a bronze medal that felt and honestly still feels like my own gold medal. I was ex I was the happiest bronze medalist um, in, in Rio. And even better because my teammates got gold and silver. So it was a USA sweep, September 11th, standing on the podium, three American flags go up, the national anthem. I mean, my family's in the stands. It'll be hard to top that ever in my, in my life. I mean, I still get, the emotions are there. You're like, giving me goosebumps. I have goosebumps too. The emotions are there like it was yesterday. It was just every, I just can't believe how it all came together like that. It was, it was incredible. How, what is the life like training to be sort of an Olympian? I mean, uh, leading up to that, I mean, what is your, what's your regimen and you're training to go to Tokyo, I take it. Yes. Yeah. So what's going on? <laughs> so Tokyo is still happening as, as hopefully knock on everything that that stays the case. Um, my race would be August 28th of 2021. We have yet to have our qualification. So, you know, hopefully I, you know, I'm being optimistic that I will be there. Unfortunately, my family will not be because spectators are not allowed, which is pretty devastating. Um, I understand why, but it doesn't mean I have to like it. Mm -hmm. Um, but training is, it's really a full-time job. I mean, this morning, so I have two kids, I have a six and a three-year-old and they're in daycare and full and kindergarten. So it's kind of depending on the morning, either my husband or I, or I leave the house at 730 and drop them off. But this morning I had to go jump on my bike and then I swam for an hour and then I got home, jumped on my bike again, got home about 10 minutes before we hopped on the call. And then this afternoon I'll go and do some strength um, from about 330 to five. And then tomorrow, kind of the same thing, swim, run. So it's kind of I would say anywhere between 15 and 20 hours a, a week. So it's, um, it's definitely a part-time job, but then, I mean, I'm old, I'm 41. So I have to do the sports med and make sure my body's, you know, ready to go as well. So it's a lot of time. My days very much revolve around my training. Is there, is there a nutrition program as well yeah, and, that yeah. they monitor? What, mm -hmm. uh, what's that like? So we have nutrition, we have sports medicine, we have, you know, sports physiologists, we have a, a, a kind of everything we need here at the Olympic Training Center to help make us the best athlete we can be. So we, we meet with a nutritionist probably a few times a month. Um, you know, it's, it's, at this point, it's more like I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and it's just a matter of doing it. But we kind of meet with her just to make sure that we are on track, going the right direction and, you know, body fat going down, you know, strength going up. This, this is a physiology question, and I'm really curious, but, you know, the leg is a pretty big uh, uh, group of muscles, right? And so how has your, uh, your, your leg difference, I mean, how do you balance that, you know, in terms of strength, like when you're working a bicycle, as an example, I mean, right. it, 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 there seems like it's, it's just an unusual physiological setup. It is. And actually on a bike, I don't even use my, so when I run, I have a prosthetic leg that I run with. Right. But when I bike, I don't, I don't wear a leg, a prosthetic leg. So I'm just biking with one leg, What you think is like, why would I do that? But my left, leg, I get such a little power out of my left leg that it's almost not even worth it. And I can get in a right. better position when I don't wear the leg. 
So when you see me biking, you're like, why, why didn't, wouldn't you wear a leg? But I actually just don't, it's not, it's not worth it for me to do that. Um, so it's all on my right leg. Yeah. When I bike and then when I run, I mean, I am used to it now, obviously it took some getting used to, to wear my running leg. But when I think about running now, I think about it with that prosthetic and it's just kind of second nature, but just like anything, it just takes getting used to. Do, do the the courses are some of the courses more difficult than others because they have a different elevation as an example they are um in the para triathlon world there's a there's only a limit as to how steep a course can be so there is a grade cap so for example in rio the olympians that race on the triathlon course they had this huge hill. I mean, they had to do six laps of this enormous hill. Mm -hmm. They changed it for the para triathletes and it was just a flat loop, not quite as exciting, a little bit more boring, but you have, you know, athletes that are missing legs like I am. You also have athletes who are in wheelchairs and they're powering their bikes and they're running, you know, wheelchairs with their arms. So going up a steep grade is, can be pretty impossible if it's steep enough. So they try to make them as level as they can. When, when you're in the midst of a race, uh, you know, are the athletes generally spread out or are there groups of athletes that could be competing side by side for a portion of the race? There are. So, the, so I mentioned earlier the different classifications. So each classification kind of has its own starting time. <clears throat> so, in, you know, my classification, I mean, if there's 10 of us, we all start at the same time and we're all in the same course at the same time. We know where each other are. And then maybe those that are in wheelchairs start, you know, 10 minutes behind us or another group starts a few minutes ahead of us. So we're all kind of out on the course at the same time. It's just a matter of where we are exactly and if we can see each other. Hmm. Now, uh, let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Tell me a little bit about Dare to Try. So Dare to Try was, I co-founded with two friends in 2012 and it's a nonprofit based out of Chicago. And we get athletes with physical disabilities into the sport of triathlon. So we had this modest goal the first year of getting, you know, seven athletes to do their very first triathlon. And triathlon is not a cheap sport. It's an expensive sport. But you add in a adaptive hand cycle that someone in a wheelchair has to use. You add in, you know, you know like a hand cycle or even an adaptive bike. You can't just go to the bike shop and get. You have to it's custom made. So it's, it's not cheap. You know, I have my running specific leg. So trying to take all the barriers away from someone that has a disability. So providing the adaptive equipment that they may need, coaching, even transportation to get to the starting line of this triathlon, doing a triathlon and just, you know, the, the my favorite moments are a first time triathlete. They cross the finish line, and here they are, and somebody with a disability. And a tra triathlon seems daunting to anybody, but especially somebody with a disability. Mm -hmm. So, but here they are, suddenly they're a triathlete. And that self confidence forth kind of carries over into all aspects of their life. So, we had this modest goal of seven athletes. I mean, it's been over 10 years. We have over 350 athletes that we've served. We have year round programming, three kind of marquee camps that we do throughout the summer. It's just, it's incredible just to be able to kind of give back and show others what they're capable of doing. And these, these athletes are not necessarily veterans who had some kind of a traumatic injury. They came from all walks of life. Exactly. So we do have some veterans. So we have, we serve youth athletes, we serve veterans, we serve adults. So kind of anyone with a disability, but we do have a military specific camp in Hammond, Indiana, in conjunction with a race called Leon's Triathlon that we, that we do every year. So we do serve a good number of veterans as well. Now you're a busy person. You've, you've uh, got all of this training going on. You've also uh, in the past been involved with the Wounded Warrior Project. Are you doing things that you go back and speak uh, now to uh, veteran groups and so forth? What's, uh, what's sort of on the agenda for you? Sure, I, I do actually, I do quite a bit of speaking, you know, not just for veteran groups, although I, I really enjoy speaking to, to veteran groups. But just a lot of, you know, various companies, organizations, I do a lot of motivational type speaking. And the goal is that when I'm done, people get up and walk away and kind of think about their own story and how they can choose to live the life that they want to live. So I enjoyed my time on the Wounded Warrior Project board. I'm no longer on it. I've been off of it for, you know, quite a few years now, but I've always kind of loved giving back to that veteran group. And if, if there, especially, I feel like there's, 
the military is, is large, but it's also can be so small. And that camaraderie kind of trifles down into being in the military, a female in the military, and then you have these you know, wounded veterans and that camaraderie is just so strong. So I, I'm very proud to be kind of in that subgroup and hopefully we can inspire those that come behind us. You know, you talk very fondly about the troops you got to lead when you were a young lieutenant. It was 20 of the finest men and women that, that, that I've ever known, definitely. I got to be a platoon leader and it was definitely the highlight of, of being in my, of my military, of my short yet eventful military career. How does everybody get in touch with you? How do people follow Melissa Stockwell? So I do have a website, melissastockwell.com. And then obviously through obviously the social media, there's mstockwell01 on Instagram and Twitter, and then Facebook, Melissa Stockwell USA. And I try to do a good job of kind of, you know, life as an athlete and being a mom and kind of everything, everything in between. We will put links to all of these things in our show notes. Uh, it amazes me, Melissa, how quickly 30 minutes goes by. Yeah, I know right. you've got a busy schedule and we're right at that. So uh, listen, we've been listening to Melissa Stockwell. She's a Olympic para-athlete and a triathlete. She is the founder of Dare to Try and a U.S. Army veteran decorated with Purple Heart and a Bronze Star. We didn't get around to mentioning that. Melissa, thank you so much for spending time with us today and stepping into the spotlight. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. You've been listening to the spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We bring veterans who are making a difference in our community to you. I'm going to give a big shout out and a bravo Zulu to Melissa Stockwell. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.